right, Agape City. How we doing on a Sunday morning? I love it. I am awake, alert. I'm excited to be back. I missed you all last week. Uh, if you were new or this is your first time ever at Agape City Church, let me introduce myself. My name is Brad. I'm the lead pastor of the church here. Last week, I was on the west side of the country uh, in, in Washington State and, 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 and serving in a ministry out there over the weekend. And can I just say this? You know, you know that phrase, like, absence makes the heart grow fonder? So true. So true. And not that, like, I'm like, bagging on their church out there. They have a great thing going. It's just a different thing. And, uh, and it's just, it was just reminding me of just, you know, being able to travel a little bit this last weekend, sharing our story of our church, sharing what God is doing, not just through us on Sunday morning, but what he's doing through us in the community and just the, the baptisms and the, the decisions for Christ. Like just everything that has happened this year, like as I started like saying it to people, it like started to dawn on me. It's like, oh, no, like, Something's happening here. Like, like, like the kingdom is actually growing here and coming here and it's expanding here. And so Agape City, I just want to say I am proud of you. I love you all. And I'm excited uh, for where we are as a church. Um, today, we're in the third week of the series that we call Take Your Life Back. Um, here's what I know is true of scripture. And, and the Bible, it says this in, in John chapter 10, verse 10. It says that Jesus came so that we may have life and have life to the full. This is what he wants for us. He wants to give us a full life. But scripture is also clear that we have opposition, that we have an enemy who is named the devil. And, and what Satan does, and the scripture is clear about this, it says that Satan steals, kills, and destroys. So here's Jesus who gives us life and life to the full, but here's the thief, here's Satan who wants to steal our life. And really what this whole series is about is how can we equip you to take your life back. If Jesus gave you life, and he gave you life so that you can have life to the fullest, and Satan wants to steal that from you, how can you take that back from Satan and live a life in peace and in the presence of God? And that's what we're trying to do here at Agape City Church. If you missed any of these weeks, you can go back and you can check them out online. Uh, week one, we talked about the need for a wake-up call that we need to wake up to what God is doing in this world, wake up to his kingdom and wake up to his will in our lives. Last week, if you were here, Bogue, you know, talking about focus and, and that we need to focus on what he's doing. And all of this content is based off a book uh, written by a pastor named Levi Lusco. And, and so in this book, he just kind of talks about the need for us to be aware. And for me, a big part of this is what we do, what we do. I love the way the, the Apostle Paul writes this in Colossians. Colossians chapter 3, we'll put it on the screen for you. It says this, Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body we are called to, to peace to, and to be thankful. Let the message of Christ dwell among you richly as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom through, hymns, uh, through psalms, hymns, and songs from the Spirit, singing to God with gratitude in our hearts. Now listen to this next verse because this is where the key comes in about what we do. It says, and whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him and whatever you do. And that's the mission we're on as Agape City is try to get church out of this, uh, out of this mindset of the place I go to and realizing that church is, is part of your identity of who you are. And, and, and everything you do is worship. Everything you do should be for the glory of God. And as Agape City, that's why we, we want to like not just teach you information, we want to challenge you to do things to actually do things in faith. And so that's why we, you know, every year we, get, we, we print these cards. It's about time for us to print up a new one for 2024. But, but and on these cards, if you've not seen these, they're in the back little lobby area in the, in the, center, the circle tables. But every month, uh, there's a party, like the movie night, or, you know, we go to Lancy Lugnuts games or whatever. There's a party that we do. That's fun. But in every month, there's something to do. There's a service to do. And if you're new, real quick, I just want to just take two minutes to explain, because what you're going to see a lot on this car is something called love outs. And love outs, I'm really, something I'm really passionate about. It's kind of like this. Love outs are where we point our love from 500 people who call Agape City their home church. We point our love to one specific people group or to one specific task. 
And if we all do it, then we get, we get this like kind of feedback loop. It's kind of like when you go to a, a Michigan game and they have a maze out, right? The maze out's only cool if everybody wears maze. A love out only works if every one of us does it. But when we do it, what happens is the recipients of that start to feel this overwhelming amount of love towards them. And they start to ask, where does this love come from? Which gives us the opportunity to you know, profess Christ. But I, just want, I say all that to say this. The October love out, if you, if you, if you didn't know this on the card, it says to, to buy someone something. Buy someone something. So like, you know, like, you know, if you're at the gas pumps, they like say, hey, can I, can I pay for your gas for you? Or, you know, if you're at a restaurant, can I pay for the coffee behind me or the person behind me? This is a challenge, right? So if you have means, if you have margin, buy someone something. This week, uh, this past week, somebody came up to me. It's like, Brad, you know, I did, I did the love out thing. I'm like, praise God, that's awesome. And she's like, <laughs> she goes, yeah, it was, it was hard. I'm like, that's the purpose. You know, the purpose is to train these things, to practice these things. You know, what was hard about it? Where she's like, well, I was at the grocery store. You know, and I knew the love I was to buy somebody something. So my, I had eyes, you know, looking, you know, I was looking. And I wasn't looking for just the, the smallest basket, okay? I was, uh, I was looking just for like, oh God, who is the person who needs this? So she was looking for someone in need. And she said, and Brad, I noticed this guy, we, we crossed in a couple aisles, and I noticed as he was picking things off the idle aisle, he was like, you know, doing something in his phone. And so he picked something, and he'd do it in his phone, and put it in, and he picked something, and be like, no, no, not that. And he put it back, and, 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 and so she was just like, man, I think this guy's like, I think money's tight. I think money's really tight, and we know how inflation's going, and, and the price of, of groceries. I think he's like literally like keeping track of the pennies so that he knows he could pay for this at the end. And so she's like, just in my heart, I felt like the right thing to do is like, I need to buy this man's groceries. So, you know, she kind of like, now, now she turns into full stalker, okay? And so now she's just kind of like, you know, stalk, you know, stalking him as he's shopping, you know? And then he gets up to the checkout line, you know, she comes up behind him and she's like, you know, hey, you know, I just, I just want to bless you. And if I could, I would just love to buy your groceries. Isn't that just amazing? It's just so amazing. And the guy turns around and he's like, oh, thank you so much for this like generosity. Uh, But I just work for DoorDash. And so (laughs) this is, these these are not even my groceries. (laughs) This is not a, I just, if you help me find the 12 ounce pinto beans, that would help. I could, I could, and I couldn't find those. And so she said, well, I'll tell you what, let me at least make sure you get a good tip. Okay, here's a a good tip for you. Um, Here's the thing. Here's what I love about that. Life is messy. People are messy, you know. And when you try something, sometimes it works out and a miracle happens. Sometimes when you try something, something silly like that happens. But I was just so blessed that here's a woman of our congregation who had eyes to see. She had a heart that was soft enough that she, she could be aware. And she at least shot her shot. She tried. And how many of us, though, we're not even seeing the people in need around us. We're not even seeing the opportunities around us. And we don't have the boldness to even try to do it. I love that we are a church of action. But what, today what I want to talk about with my time is where does that action come from? Because it doesn't start with action. It starts with our thoughts. And if we're going to take our life back, I believe it starts with taking our thoughts back. The same way this woman, you know, because of, of the challenge on this card, she started to think about ways to bless people. So then she saw opportunities to bless people, and then she had the boldness to try to bless a person. But all of that re- re- came from the seed of a thought. And I believe you and I, a huge part of us taking our life back is us taking our thoughts back, holding your thoughts I don't know if you're like, if you have like, remember like if you had small children, I don't know if you were a small child, but do you remember like having like a seven-year-old in your home, whether it's like a niece, a nephew, or your own child or whatever, do you remember like being present for the stream of consciousness of a seven-year-old? That they, they, they just literally they say out loud every single thought that's going through, you know, and, da, 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 and what does the world look like? And how much water is in the world? And are giraffes ever short? And, da, da, da. and like, and they just stream of consciousness, every thought in their mind, they're just saying it, Right? And I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but your, your child comes up, maybe you're in a middle of conversation, and they're like, you know, hey, Dad, you know, where does cinnamon come from? What does it look like in nature? And whatever. And, and you're like, baby, hold your thought. Hold that thought. And you finish your conversation, and da-da-da-da. And, and then you sort of turn back, and you're like, okay, what were you saying? And you ever had this happen where the, the, the kid goes, I don't remember. <laughs> and every dad knows what the appropriate response is supposed to be, Right? Must not have been that important of a thought. 
about dad jokes. Yeah, you know. We have this experience, and, 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 and as an adult to a child, we, we see this. Like, you know, a child is just just random stream of thought, and they're just saying every thought out loud. And if you have them hold their thought, oftentimes, sometimes they forget those thoughts because they're not important thoughts. They're just the thought of the moment. And when you ask them to sit on it, it just kind of dissipates in their mind. Isn't it funny, though? I believe we kind of do that to our children, but I believe God looks at us like that. I believe we come to God and we're, God, God, what about, what about this thing? What about this problem? What about this fear? What about this insecurity? God, what about these people? And I don't know if they're talking to me or not. He's dodging my email and I don't know. My, he left my, my text unread. And, like, and I, I think sometimes we come to God with this flow of consciousness of every insecurity, every fear, every doubt that we have. And I believe there are times where God's going to look at you and me and God's going to say, hey, hold that thought for a minute. Just hold that thought. And I think if, we're, if we were willing to slow down, if we're willing to, like, to test our thoughts I think we would come to find that sometimes our thoughts are not true. Sometimes they're not really that even that important. And if we hold our thoughts, I think we might find that we actually have the power to change our thoughts, to control our thoughts, and to think thoughts that would put us into a place to do the actions we want to do. You have to realize that the actions that you, you know, take part in, they start with the seed of a thought. The old adage is, is this, and maybe you've heard this old adage before, but it says if, if you sow a thought, you're going to reap an action. If you sow an action, you're going to reap a habit. If you sow a habit, you're going to reap your character. And when you sow your character, then you're going to reap a destiny. This is so true. It all builds off of your thoughts. And you need to understand this. Your thoughts can derail you. Your thoughts are literally like these trains. And you would never get on a train if you didn't know where it was going. You would never get on a train if you didn't know, you know the, the exit or the stop that you were going to be getting off on. When you get on a train, you, you, know, you look at the, the, the map of the station. Okay, I'm going to get on here. I'm going to get off there. And you get on the train, and on the train itself is a map. Okay, I'm here. I'm this stop. Now I'm at this stop. Now at this stop, I'm getting off. Like we know like, that we, we would never get on a train and just like go along with it. But for so many of us, we get on these thought trains I'm insecure, I'm insignificant, nobody likes me, it's so hard, nobody has it as hard as I do, it's just so tough right now. And we're literally letting the train loose. And we're just riding this train into actions and into habits and into, into character flaws and into a destiny that we were never meant to live but we created from our thoughts I believe scripture speaks very clearly to this. I think God cares deeply about how you manage, how you control your thoughts, and that you do not let your thoughts control you. If you're taking notes, it's a great verse to write down and, and to, to memorize and, and, and to really practice. It's in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, and this is what the Apostle Paul says about holding your thoughts. He says this, we demolish arguments in every uh, pretension that sets itself up against the knowledge of God. And we take, look at this, we take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. We take captive every thought to make it obedient, obedient to Christ. Here's the truth. We can't stop thoughts from happening right? Based on our past, based on our habits, based on whatever. Sometimes thoughts just pop in your head. And you know, like there's thoughts that pop in your head that we're never supposed to say out loud, but they pop in your head. And you would never act on them, but they pop in your head. Have you ever had like a thought, like an intrusive thought? You know what intrusive thoughts are, right? Like when you're driving down 59 and you're like, well, you know, I could just, huh, you know, like, I mean, I wouldn't, I would never, but I could, huh, you know, like, you know, and like, where did that thought come from? You're like, that's a very dark, intrusive thought, right? <laughs> All right, anyway, uh, like, that's just a line. It doesn't stop anything. Anyway, okay. Um, but not every thought is meant to be acted upon. And maybe you can't control a thought from coming into your mind, but you can control how long that thought stays there. And what I see in the scripture is whatever thought comes to your mind, we are not helpless. We're not weak. We have a way that we could take captive our thoughts. We have authority that we can make obedient our thoughts to that which we want 
the will of Jesus Christ. So we can literally say, this thought is happening, and I don't like that thought. So I want to replace it with something else, and I want that thing to be glorifying to Jesus because my destiny is to glorify him, so I'm going to plant seeds of thoughts that glorify him. If you're taking notes, let me give you a great resource, uh, uh, something to benchmark all of your thoughts against. Like if, if, if I were you, if, if I had these thoughts come into my mind, whatever they were, I would run them through these filters because I, I believe these filters will help us take captive our thoughts. In Philippians chapter four, verse eight, the apostle Paul, he gives us so much information about how to manage our minds. And this is what the apostle Paul says in Philippians chapter four. He says this, finally, brothers and sisters, if you have these intrusive thoughts, if you have negative thoughts, if you have dark thoughts, if you have thoughts that Satan is planting in your mind and not God, he says this, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. We are called to take our thoughts captive and put them through this filter. And I love the very first one. Is it true? Is it true? One of the great, greatest books on this topic, I cannot recommend it highly enough. I'll be leading a, a book study through it this fall, but it's, it's a book by an author named John Mark Comer. He's a pastor in the Portland area. He's a brilliant man. And he wrote this book um, called Live No Lies. And you and I have to stop living the lies of culture, the lies of society, and the lies are just pouring out on the masses. The first thing we need to ask ourselves is, is this true? And then it goes on and it talks about, you know, these other attributes then, you know, is it not just true, but is it, you know, noble? Uh, is it right? Is it pure? Is it lovely? But we need to have a filtering uh, process so that we actually take our thoughts captive and we make sure we're only holding on to the thoughts that lead us to the destiny that we want to experience. So here's what I want to do with the, with the last bit of my time here. I want to give you five areas. And if you're taking notes, I would really love for you to write these down. I want to give you five areas where I believe um, thoughts come into our mind that, that I, I think we need to be aware. We need to be aware of truth in these areas. Because I think these five areas are the five of the main ways that Satan plants seeds of thoughts in our mind that leads to destinies that we were never meant to experience because God put truth in these areas that Satan is trying to weed out. So let me give you five areas of thought that, that you can put your thoughts to these filters. And, and the first one is this. When you start, how you think about your identity. This is key. This is so big. This is bigger than you probably even give it credit for. You understanding your identity in God, your identity as a child of God, and understanding that your identity in God is one of the most important things about your faith. Your, the identity in God is where you're supposed to get your strength. It's where you're supposed to get your self-esteem. Not in your own strength or in your own education or your own whatever. It's supposed to be through your identity that you find this resolve with who you are. And so when you think about your identity, the lie is going to be is who are you? Who are you? You're not smart, you're not good, you're not strong, you're not loved. These are the lies that Satan says. You're not popular, you're not, you know, you know, whatever. Like these are the lies that Satan wants to attack your identity. And what you need to do is you need to have a bank of scriptures where you know the truth of who you are. And that you are a child of the living God. You are a child of a king. That you are heirs and co-heirs with Christ. That, that you, know, you need to understand who you are. So that when those, those thoughts come in, those intrusive thoughts are like that you're not enough, you got to hold those captive. Throw those away and tell yourself the truth. You see this all throughout scripture. I'll give you three examples uh, right here. But just look at Moses, Jeremiah, and the disciples. Moses, Jeremiah, and the disciples. We think of Moses as, you know, he led the people through the Exodus. Jeremiah was one of the greatest prophets who, who you, know, you know, prophesied about the, you know, Babylonian, the Babylons and what's going to happen with there. And then the disciples who started the kingdom of God and then what we call the church today. But look who, how these people behaved left unto themselves. When their identity was all on, their, um, on themselves, it says, but Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? Jeremiah says, alas, sovereign Lord, I don't know how to speak. I'm too young. And even the disciples, on the evening that, of that first day of the week when Jesus was in the tomb, he says, when the disciples were together with the doors locked, for they were in fear of the Jewish leaders. 
Who am I? I'm too young. I'm not smart. We're scared. Those are real human emotions. Those are real human thoughts. But what I love is that God through scripture shows us that we're never supposed to do any of this stuff on our own strength. Your identity is in him. So look at the, the flip side of these. You know, Moses says, well, who am I? Well, God says, I will be with you. It doesn't matter who you are. I'm with you. God says to Jeremiah, do not be afraid of them for I am with you and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. And then Jesus says to the disciples, surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. The thought is I'm not strong enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not significant enough to bring the kingdom of God to its fullness. But the truth is it was never supposed to be meant on, based on you alone. Your identity was in Christ and Christ in you. And the question is, are you obedient enough? Are you willing to risk buying that person the thing? Are you willing to risk to say, hey, I saw you. Can I pray for you? Are you willing to risk being who you were meant to be, your identity in Christ? Another area that we we need to really be aware of is our humanity. And when I think about the humanity, it's not just like like that we're human beings and we have bodies and we have flesh. Um, We need to really see the humanity in other people. This is what we see happening right now uh, in the news. And I don't want to go real deep into it, but like with what's going on between Israel and Palestine, people are taking sides and they want to look at these human beings like they're teens. And the truth is any innocent human being um, has value in the eyes of God. And so we don't want any, anybody being killed. We don't want anybody being in fear or in terror. We don't want that. So, but we can't just like say like like all people who are different than us are the enemy. We got to see their humanity. And and in some way, we got to bring that humanity out. This is way more difficult than than I know how to do. And that's why it's been an issue for thousands of years. And and so we just need to be praying for what's going on in Israel. And we do need to be praying for peace uh, to to come and and for killing to stop. But but what does that look like in Michigan. What does it look like to people who are opposed to you? People who, who offend you, who hurt you, people who, who uh, you know, let you down. Like, can you see their humanity? Let me give you a scripture that I, I believe helps with this as we're like trying to grow in our humanity and understanding of people's humanity. Um, it's in the book of Romans, Romans chapter 12, verse 18. And this is a scripture that I apply to my life. And I think about this when, whenever someone lets me down. It says this, if it is all possible. And first off, I love that there's a like caveat, like if it's possible. Because sometimes it's like not. But if it is all possible, as much as it depends on you. So with my strength, with my ability, with my will, as much as it depends on you. It says, if it's all possible, as much as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. And then this is the part that, is, that we need to be mindful of. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. And I love that because like, that's what we do. We take revenge. If someone hurts us, we want to hurt them back. If someone offends us, we want to offend them back. We just are, we're just reacting. And a lot of times when it comes to justice, it's a reactive thing for many of us. For God, it's not reactive. He's not getting revenge. He's getting, he's avenging. God is proactive. And so when someone harms us, what God knows is God knows why that person is willing to harm you. God knows what's in that person, what's broken in that person, what's deficient in that person. God knows what's insecure in that person. God knows what's afraid, what's fear in that person. God knows why that person did what they did. And oftentimes people who do dark things do it out of a dark place in their heart, a place of hatred. And God says, I will avenge that. But you gotta trust who me, you gotta trust your, who I say I am and your identity in me. And then trust the humanity of the person next to you. That that person, that person still has a soul and there's still a chance that that soul could repent and that soul could not be destroyed in hell forever or separated from God forever. That soul could be redeemed in heaven. And we gotta know that that ultimately matters it matters. So we need to see the humanity in other people. Try to live at peace with people. Try to help people. 
I love a quote by Ralph uh, Waldo Emerson. Uh, he had this quote. It talks about helping other people. It says this. It's, it's one of the most beautiful compensations of life that no man can sincerely try to help another without helping himself. When we see opportunities to forgive, when we see opportunities to, to, to lean in, when we see opportunities to help other people, we're freeing ourselves from hatred. We're freeing ourselves from, from the, you know, you know, this, the lack of peace. And we're giving opportunity for the kingdom of God, the love of God, the community of God to grow. Society is not going to tell you that that is like the intuitive way to do things. But God is going to tell you time and time again that is the correct way to do things. So with the mindset of our identity, we need to put it in God. Our mindset of humanity, we need to know that people are flawed and failed or, and, 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 and out of their hurt, they're hurting people. I'll give you another area we need to like have a, a true mindset is in the area of adversity. Adversity. We have to become more bold as followers of Jesus. We have to be more bold as men and women of faith. We have to have broader shoulders to be able to handle the adversity of this world. One of the best lines I've ever heard someone say to me is, Brad, we need to stop praying for light loads. Instead, we need to start praying for, for, for stronger backs. In this world, you will have trouble. In this world, we do have opposition. And so we need to stop pretending or stop feeling like if adversity comes our way that something is wrong or God is failing us. No, we need to realize that we should be strengthened enough to handle this adversity, adversity even right now. I'll give you a verse on this. The Apostle Paul, he, just, he, he, he sums it up in one line, and it's so uh, true if you can anchor this in your heart. But he says this, For our light and momentary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. Our light and momentary troubles When Paul writes that, you need to understand he's not talking about stubbing your toe. He's not talking about you didn't get the parking space up close and so you had to park at the end. But these are light and momentary troubles. Now Paul's saying death itself is a light and momentary trouble. Captivity itself is a light and momentary trouble. Torture itself is a light and momentary and momentary trouble. Martyrdom, to give my life for my faith, is a light and momentary tr trouble compared to the greatness and the glory of eternity. We have to have our mindset on what is true. And what is true is that his kingdom is coming. And what is true in this world, we will have trouble. What is true, though, God has overcame this world. So what is true is we can get through this adversity. We're made for this. When you read the book of Acts and you see the persecution of the church, you don't see a church getting destroyed. You see it getting spread out. And wherever it spreads to, you see it growing back. Could we do that again? Can we do that again? That should be our call, that we should always be willing to spread and grow as the church. And no adversity stops us. No adversity squashes us out because the faith of God that's in us. Identity, humanity, humanity, adversity. Let's talk about anxiety. This is a huge one in 2023. You talk about like, you know, the seven-year-old and the flow of consciousness and just the thoughts they're saying and like, hold that thought, right? I mean, as I'm getting older, I'm realizing there's really no such thing as adults. We're all just big kids. And that flow of thought is still happening, but usually it's not about slime when you're in your 40s. It's about every possible thing that could go wrong in your life that could go wrong to a loved one and that can go wrong in this world. Many of us have a loop playing in our mind of these repetitive thoughts and we're ruminating on this negativity which is causing this fear and uncertainty to well up in us. I'm not saying this like a judgment in my heart. I'm, I'm saying this like I, I see this as a real issue. Anxiety not just in adults and teenagers and kids. It's like, it is a problem in 2023. And how do we address it? And, and, and there's so many ways, but, but I do believe training our thoughts is a huge part of this. And I believe scripture gives us hope and things that we can do to address anxiety, that we can combat anxiety. If you're in, 
In Philippians, just a couple verses before what we read, verse eight, but if you go back to Philippians uh, chapter four, verse six, it says this, do not be anxious about anything. Okay, thanks, Paul. You know, like, don't be anxious. Like, that's, like, that's like getting in an argument with your spouse and being like, calm down. <laughs> don't ever say that. <laughs> you want a surefire way to, to make someone not calm down? Just tell them to calm down, right? So it starts off kind of flippant. Don't be anxious about anything. Like, okay, Paul, that's okay, that's not really helpful. But what I love is Paul does get practical and he does help. If you don't want to be anxious about anything, well, the goal is not just like, you know, it's not, it's not just willpower to stop being anxious, you know, like force yourself to stop being anxious. No, no, no. You're going to have this nervous energy, you're going to have these ruminating thoughts. So when Paul says, don't be anxious about anything, he says, so here's what you should do with that energy. And here's what you should do with those thoughts. Don't be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. When you're anxious about something, what do you really want? I'm not a good flyer. I don't do awesome on airplanes. And so when I get on an airplane, I'm, I'm a little bit, yeah, you know, like, 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 eh, you know. I'm functional, but I'm just, yeah, I'm not comfortable, you know. And as that plane starts barreling down the runway, I think about why am I anxious? I'm anxious because I don't believe these pilots are in control. <laughs> I'm anxious because I don't think these air traffic controllers know what's going on in the area. <laughs> I'm anxious because if something goes wrong, I could die. And I'm not afraid of, like, death because I know I'm going to go to heaven, but, like, you know what I'm anxious about? Not seeing my girls grow up and seeing them being established in life and in marriages and just knowing that the, I completed my journey as a parent and they're on a good path. That's really the root of my anxiety when I'm flying, that my life is going to be cut short and I'm going to not be able to complete raising my daughters. So now when I fly, I still feel anxious, but you know what? With prayer and petition, Lord God, help these pilots to be aware of what everything is going on in this plane. Father, if something should go wrong, help them to go through their checklist and make their correct decision the first time. Father, be with these air traffic controllers. Help them to see all these planes around us and that they see them true and that they can guide us out of this airport and into the next one safely. Father God, you know I love you and you know I do not fear eternity without you, but Lord, if you could give me this one kindness, I do want to see my daughters grow and be married, but Father, your will be done, not mine. That's a very personal prayer I pray every single time I get on an airplane. <laughs> But that's what I focus on, not my fear. I don't know what is the root of your anxiety, but I would challenge you, don't just feel it, dig to find a root of it and lay that at Jesus' feet through prayer and petition with thanksgiving. Thank you, God, that you hear this and see if he does not give you peace that can be beyond, be beyond understanding. Identity, humanity, adversity, anxiety. And then finally, like we said at the beginning, destiny. Destiny. Your thoughts lead to actions. Your actions lead to habits. Your habits will lead to your character. Your character is going to lead to your destiny. And some of you all don't realize the reason you're in a place in your life where you hate where you are in life, it started with a mindset. So if we want to change it, we can't just change our, our address. We can't just change our, our, our income. We can't just change our vocation. We need to change our minds so that we can experience the destiny that God wants for us. The Apostle Paul hits this perfectly in Romans chapter 12, the very first two verses of that chapter. He says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Look at verse 2. Do not conform to the patterns of this world, but be transformed, not by action, not by possessions, not by working out or strength or anything. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, his pleasing, and his perfect will. 
If you want your life to be in step with the destiny that God has for you, it starts here. It starts with transforming your mind to not say my will be done, but rather say, God, your will be done. And if you don't know what God's will is, you have to open up his word. So Agape City, here's my challenge to you this week. Would you try to do that? I gave you some information this morning, but that information is only gonna be useful is if you use it to take your life back.